I know what they want to say. So is he going to do, <coughs> you're going to do Conley? Are you going to be the ranking? What, uh, yes, he's going to be. Oh, he is coming? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, just coming from the Capitol. Uh, the Subcommittee on Government Operations and the Subcommittee on uh, Intergovernmental Affairs will come to order without objection. Uh, the presiding members are authorized to declare a recess at any time. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer, uh, for his leadership on this particular issue, and certainly for the ranking members, Mr. Conley and Mr. Rankin, uh, Raskin. Uh, we. Uh, we appreciate all of you being here. As we look at the hearing today to uh, examine once again uh, improper payments, particularly within Medicaid, um, it's very simple that as we look at the payments that, that should not have been made and were made for the in incorrect amounts. These issues encompass uh, the entire federal government and is, in, a, in, in fact, improper payments are a huge problem. Uh, the GAO estimates that there's over $1 trillion in improper payments since the fiscal year 2003. Now, again, that's $1 trillion uh, since 2003. In fiscal year 2017 alone, the government got it wrong to the tune of $141 billion in improper payments. This uh, amount of money is indeed staggering, as they say back home. Eventually, this adds up to real money, and, uh, and so uh, it is incumbent upon all of you as we look at the testimony today to hopefully highlight how we're going to address this issue. Uh, for some of you, this is... Um, Ms. Tinker, your, your first rodeo uh, here. Uh, we will try to make sure that it is uh, not memorable in a negative way, and, uh, and so welcome. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services accounts for the largest amount of improper payments with over $90 billion. Uh, the Medicaid program accounts for over $36 billion, or 40 percent of the HHS uh, improper payments. And if we think about that number, $36 billion in taxpayer dollars that are unaccounted for for one federal program, uh, it, it is not only staggering, but you start to look at it and say, why aren't we addressing it? Uh, one of the keys to addressing improper payments and restoring program integrity for the Medicaid issue is having complete, accurate, and timely data. Uh, screening Medicaid providers uh, with better data could prevent some of the improper payments uh, that are made to bad actors. Now, I also want to stress that because we, we look at this, there are times when we have improper payments, there are times when uh, some of those things are not indeed fraudulent, they're not bad actors, they perhaps are a result of our bu uh, bu bureaucratic uh, network that we have, uh, I'd be interested in hearing that. I'm, I'm one that believes that every improper payment isn't necessarily because of a bad actor. And yet, uh, when we look at this, uh, Ms. Tinker, uh, you're from HHS OIG, uh, you've illustrated the importance of providing screening uh, in your testimony, but describing some of the cases in Virginia and North Carolina. And in the Virginia case, one individual participated in a scheme to defraud this special caregiver program covered by Medicaid by submitting timesheets for services that weren't actually provided. Those are the kind of things that we do need to go after. This individual was in jail at the time, so it was amazing how creative they were getting from a jail cell, and a simple check of his status could have stopped the fraud, and yet somehow that didn't happen. In North Carolina, a mental health facility operator defrauded Medicaid by submitting at least $2.5 million in fraudulent claims for services never provided to the beneficiaries with developmental uh, disabilities. Now, to support these fraudulent claims, this individual used stolen beneficiary information from a company he per previously co-owned that was no longer operational. And this could have been stopped with better data uh, and a site visit. And when we look at these kinds of things, uh, you would say, well, these should be easy uh, operational checks that in the private sector, if you were writing 
checks, you would actually say, well, if we're going to write a $2.5 million check, you would want to make sure that it was for legitimate purposes. So we need to look at it, and I'm going to challenge all of you to look at this as if it were your own money, uh, because indeed it is. It is the people's money, and sometimes we forget when we're uh, looking at this that it's a mom and dad and an aunt and uncle and, quite frankly, people who pay the taxes each and every day uh, that we have an, an obligation, a stewardship that we have to oversee. You know, the o o Obamacare's dramatic expansion of Medicaid has further highlighted the need for better data to determine eligibility. And if we're going to, you know, if, if we are going to make sure that Medicaid dollars are going to those programs designed, uh, that they're designed to cover, uh, we need to also effectively look at detecting improper payments and fraud, and we need complete and accurate national data on Medicaid. Uh, so for almost 20 years after Congress directed states to submit such data, the Transform Medicaid Statistical Information uh, Procura is still a work in progress after 20 years. And so uh, it is incumbent that we come together today. I, I see my time has run, run out in terms of my opening statement, but um, we look forward to hearing from all of you. And with that, I will recognize uh, the ranking member, Mr. Raskins, for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for that very fine opening statement. Um, and thanks to all of our witnesses for testifying today. Um, Medicaid provides comprehensive, affordable care to more than 70 million Americans, regardless of their pre-existing health conditions. And um, I want to start just by identifying the fact that that's an historic achievement and triumph that we have uh, um, a Medicaid system that is addressing the health needs of so many Americans. Roughly 40 percent of the beneficiaries are children, including nearly half of all kids with special health care needs and one in four children in my home state of Maryland. <clears throat> one in five Medicare beneficiaries relies on Medicaid for long-term care and other benefits. Um, <clears throat> thanks to the um, ACA's Medicaid expansion, 12 million more Americans have gained health coverage for the very first time. Today's hearing focuses on improper payments, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, which include overpayments, underpayments, and legitimate payments with paperwork errors, as well as fraudulent payments. Uh, this year's improper payment rate, I understand, was 10.1%. One dollar of an improper payment is a dollar too much, whether it's a dollar at Medicaid or the VA or the Pentagon or whatever program it might be, and we can all agree that 10 percent is just too high. But solving that problem must take into account the fact that all 50 states administer their own Medicaid programs, and they all have their own challenges maintaining program integrity. It's a large and decentralized system, and it can be leaky. So all 50 state Medicaid agencies, along with the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, must work together to lower the rate of improper payments, not only in the interest of preserving our tax dollars, but also because fraud and inefficiency threaten the stability of Medicaid and deprive enrollees of the benefits that they rightfully rely on. Fortunately, the ACA gave CMS new program integrity tools to fight fraud, including enhanced provider screening requirements. And I'm eager to hear about uh, people's perspectives on that today. Um, we should reject the notion that errors in Medicaid justify uh, slashing federal funding or undermining the federal state financing structure or imposing work requirements on Medicaid beneficiaries. I think all of these things are non sequitur. Um, I hope we will use this hearing as an opportunity to learn from the experts gathered today to how we can improve the Medicaid program. Um, and I'd like to close simply by sharing the experience of one of my constituents, uh, Elena from Silver Spring, whose family relies on Medicaid. Her daughter has serious medical conditions affecting her heart, her lung, her airways, and her kidneys. She spent the first five months of her life in an ICU and had three major surgeries before she could use a ventilator and oxygen tank, which allow her now finally to breathe uh, to this day. But she must see over a dozen specialists 
to receive the care that she needs. When Elena's daughter left the hospital at five months old, she had incurred over $3 million in medical bills, an amount which would be higher today, and it includes medical supplies and equipment, medications, additional procedures, and more. Elena and her family have depended on Medicaid and the ACA to save their family from financial ruin and to save her daughter's life. This story reminds us of why Medicaid is so important, why we have to do everything we can to strengthen this vital program and to guarantee that every dollar is going actually to serve the beneficiaries of the program. I hope this hearing brings us closer to this goal, and I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for convening the meeting. I thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman uh, from Alabama, uh, Chairman Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today's hearing marks the continuation of the committee's close look at the rising problem of federal improper payments. Uh, as we watch the national debt continue to climb and proper payments grow with it, as Chairman Meadows pointed out, uh, since 2003, uh, we've sent out a trillion dollars in improper payments. I'd only add to that that that's a trillion dollars plus interest. We've been operating in deficit all those years, so every dollar that we sent out improperly was a borrowed dollar. Uh, every year, the federal government loses billions of taxpayer dollars because of improper payments, dollars that were intended to fund programs that serve the people uh, that are improperly paid out or, or managed. As uh, I, In my questions, I'll address this a little bit more. Uh, the General Accountability Office has been unable to render an opinion on the federal government's consolidated financial statement since 1997. Uh, due in part to the federal government's inability to adequately account for and reconcile its financial activities. GAO has also stated with respect to improper payments that absent changes, the federal government continues to face an unsustainable long-term fiscal path. This is the reason we're here today. Uh, we want to try to figure out a way to solve this. As Chairman Meadows cited, the federal government reported $141 billion uh, in improper payments last year, fiscal year 2017. Uh, a $4 billion increase from just two years ago. Over two-thirds of these erroneous payments originated from the Department of Health and Human Services. The rapid growth in improper payments is largely attributed to the Medicaid program, which is the focus of, uh, of this hearing. Uh, Medicaid uh, uh, is a federally funded, state-administered uh, program that covers over 73 million people. The, the program represents about a sixth of, of the national health care economy and accounts for over $36 billion dollars in improper payments. I think it was about $36.7 billion to be precise. The GAO has placed the Medicaid program on its high risk list every year since 2003. That makes 15 years and counting. Uh, state partners are on the front lines of defense against these erroneous payments. However, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, plays a critical role in monitoring and supporting state efforts to reduce and recover improper payments. Although the states have great flexibility in implementing Medicaid, they are constrained by lack of federal guidance and overwhelmed by the vast increase in enrollment from expansion of the program under Obamacare. Diligent bipartisan oversight is imperative in order to curb Medicaid's current trajectory as the fastest growing source of improper payments. Today we will hear from our witnesses um, about current efforts to strengthen federal and state partnerships in the Medicaid program and, and, uh, and make an attempt to ensure program integrity. To achieve the necessary reform of Medicaid, only a whole of government oversight approach will safeguard the faith and credit of American taxpayers. I thank the witnesses for coming today and I look forward to hearing their testimony. I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Alabama. Um, I uh, am now pleased to introduce our witnesses, uh, Mr. Tim Hill, Deputy Director at the Center for Medicaid and CHIP Services, Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome, Mr. Hill. Ms. Megan uh, Tinker, uh, Senior Advisor for Legal Review in the Office of uh, Counsel to the Inspector General, uh, Department of Health and Human Sor Services. Uh, welcome, Ms. Tinker. Uh, Ms. Carolyn Yoakum. Uh, Director of Health Care at the Government Accountability Office, welcome. Uh, the Honorable Dara Papera, uh, Legislative Auditor for the State of Louisiana, and I, I, I believe you're accompanied by Mr. Wesley uh, Gooch, uh, Special Assistant for Health Care Audit, who will also be sworn in. 
and uh, Mr. Andy Schneider, a research professor of practice at the Center for Children and uh, Families at Georgetown University, uh, McCourt School of Public Policy. That is a mouthful, Mr. Schneider. Welcome. Uh, welcome to you all. Pursuant to commi uh, committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify, so if you will please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. All right. Thank you. you may be seated. Uh, let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, in order to allow time for discussion, please limit your testimony to five minutes. However, your entire written testimony will be made part of the record. And as a reminder, uh, uh, the clock in front of you uh, will, will show the remaining time during your opening statement. The light will turn yellow, which means you better speed up. you got 30 seconds left. Uh, and red means that you are subject to being gaveled down at any time, hopefully in a light tap first and then a stronger tap later. Um, but we also... Um, uh, ask you to press the red button or the button in front of you to turn on your microphone before uh, speaking. So, Mr. Mr. Hill, uh, we will go ahead and recognize uh, you for five minutes. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Chairman Meadows and Palmer, Ranking Member Raskin, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to discuss CMS's efforts to prevent and reduce improper payments in Medicaid. We share your commitment to ensuring that spending for Medicaid is devoted to the care and the well-being of the beneficiaries that we serve and is not wasted through error or fraud. In that regard, we greatly appreciate the ongoing work by the OIG and the GAO to highlight potential vulnerabilities in these important programs. And similarly, I want to recognize the work of this committee on these important issues, particularly with respect to Medicaid reimbursement and financing issues. I want to use my time this morning to highlight some of the foundational work we do here at CMS to promote the integrity of the Medicaid program and then spend a little time emphasizing some of the new initiatives and approaches that this administration has initiated in this area. In terms of our foundational work, I like to think of our efforts as resting on a three-legged stool. The first leg of the stool is measurement. Our primary tool in this regard is the Payment Error Rate Measurement Program, or PERM. Using PERM, we measure and report on improper payments in Medicaid. The information we get from this program, in addition to just measuring and giving, giving us a measure, actually helps us identify the underlying cause of payment error. What is it that's driving the, the error rate? Using this information, we can drive states to implement corrective actions to reduce improper payments and to prevent them in the future. The second leg of the stool is partnership. We work with our state partners to provide the information, the resources, and the technical assistance they need to implement programs to safeguard Medicaid. The best illustration of our efforts in this area is our Medicaid Integrity Institute, established in collaboration with the Department of Justice, where we bring together state employees, CMS policy experts, our law enforcement partners, and other stakeholders to collaborate and share best practices while simultaneously staying up to date on emerging program vulnerabilities. The final leg of the stool is a robust financial oversight activities to ensure that when states ultimately claim for federal match on their expenditures, federal Medicaid funds are spent lawfully and appropriately. We use specialized accountants and financial management analysts to review state claims each quarter using trend analysis, environmental scanning, and the results of external audits to find anomalies and request additional documentation or justifications for spending when necessary. We also engage in state-specific reviews ongoing site, on, going on-site to state Medicaid programs to ensure that state expenditures and corresponding claims for federal funds are allowable. Last year, we worked with states to resolve $2.7 billion in questionable costs through this program. Under the leadership of Secretary Azar and Administrator Verma, we are building on this foundation to further enhance and strengthen our oversight efforts. As you know, this administration is fully committed to providing as much flexibility as possible to states to help them structure Medicaid programs that work for the people and the situations of their state. In return for this flexibility, we will be holding states accountable in new and important ways. For example, for the first time ever, we are implementing a Medicaid scorecard to measure and report on Medicaid performance across three pillars, health systems, federal administrative performance, and state administrative performance. 
Driving improvement using the scorecard is integral to our efforts to safeguard Medicaid from unnecessary and wasteful spending. Underpinning the scorecard initiative is the implementation of the Transformed Medicaid Information System, or TMSIS. The data we collect in TMSIS will drive the analytics that will help us and states improve health outcomes and improve program integrity. I'm happy to report that as of today, TMSIS includes the data for 98% of the beneficiaries we serve, and we expect the remaining data, which represents one state, to be live in the system shortly. In terms of oversight of state financing problems, we've closed off financing loopholes and that some states have used to generate federal dollars to support state programs that are best supported with state-only dollars. Finally, we're bolstering our ongoing efforts to ensure that states are appropriately determining eligibility for beneficiaries in the expansion population. While we have significant existing controls in this area, we are concerned by recent OIG findings about state implementation of eligibility systems, as well as the findings of our own review of state managed care rates for beneficiaries in the expansion group. The issue is a top priority for this administration and the CMS administrator, and moving forward, CMS will continue to enhance our oversight efforts to make sure states are appropriately enrolling beneficiaries and that the federal government is bearing only its fair share of the cost for Medicaid. We look forward to continuing to work with our states and oversight partners and other stakeholders to improve efforts uh, to reduce the improper payment rate in Medicaid. I thank you, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Ms. Tinker, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Meadows and Palmer, ranking members Connolly and Raskin, and other distinguished members of the subcommittees. I am Megan Tinker of the Office of the Inspector General. Thank you for inviting me to discuss improper payments in Medicaid and the need for robust national Medicaid data. Medicaid is a $574 billion program that touches the health and welfare of 69 million Americans. In 2016, Medicaid estimated improper payments totaled $36 billion. Today, I will highlight recommendations that OIG has made to help states and CMS secure the data necessary to reduce improper payments. OIG's work clearly shows that in order to gain the full benefit of 21st century data analytics, Medicaid needs comprehensive national data. We recommend that CMS and states focus on OIG's core program integrity principles, prevention, detection, and enforcement. First, prevent improper payments by using data to keep bad actors and ineligible beneficiaries from participating in Medicaid. Second, Detect improper payments by using data to identify potential fraud, waste, and abuse. And third, enforce, take swift and appropriate enforcement actions to correct problems and prevent future harm. Our work shows that states often lack the necessary data to prevent bad actors from participating in Medicaid. Doing so effectively can reduce and prevent improper payments. For example, OIG has raised concerns that states are not conducting required provider screenings, such as criminal background checks. Preventing improper payments also means ensuring Medicaid only serves eligible beneficiaries. OIG reviews of three states found that their enrollment data systems sometimes lacked the ability to reliably make proper eligibility determinations, which could result in incorrect payments. Quality data are vital to decreasing improper payments and to ensuring a high-performing Medicaid program. CMS has made progress in implementing TMSIS, which is the Transformed Medicaid Statistical Information System. TMSIS is a national system to aggregate Medicaid claims data. As of this month, as Mr. Hill said, almost all states are reporting data to TMSIS. However, there is more to do to make sure that the data can be used effectively to prevent and detect improper payments and fight fraud, waste, and abuse. Improper payments and fraud do not respect state borders. Without complete and uniform national data, fraud schemes affecting multiple states are difficult to detect because we cannot see the whole picture. Utilization and spending patterns may not appear problematic until compared with other states. CMS must remain vigilant and ensure that states are consistently reporting data elements to TMSIS and that those are the data elements that will best inform program integrity efforts. In addition, an ever-increasing number of Medicaid patients receive some or all of their services through managed care. 
OIG's work has shown that state's Medicaid managed care data was incomplete when submitted to CMS. As a result, both federal and state governments lack the transparency to ensure proper oversight. OIG has seen the benefits of data in identifying and targeting bad actors in Medicare. For example, last summer, the Medicare Fraud Strike Force used comprehensive Medicare data, including data on opioid prescribing, to conduct the largest national healthcare fraud takedown in history. Over 400 individuals were charged for their alleged participation in healthcare fraud screens, responsible for $1.3 billion in fraud losses across numerous states. We cannot replicate this type of enforcement action in the Medicaid program because we still lack comprehensive national Medicaid data. It remains to be seen whether TMSIS will live up to its potential. That is why it is critical that CMS persist in ensuring the availability of complete, accurate, and timely national Medicaid data. Such data are essential to preventing, detecting, and decreasing improper payments and to the efficiency and effectiveness of the Medicaid program. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Ms. Tinker. Ms. Yoakum, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Meadows, Chairman Palmer, Ranking Members Connolly and Raskin, and members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to be here to discuss oversight efforts in Medicaid. This joint federal state program financed health care services for over 70 million low income and medically needy individuals, including children and people who are elderly or disabled. Medicaid is a significant component of federal and state budgets, with nearly 600 billion in estimated outlays for 2017. Due to concerns about the adequacy of oversight, Medicaid has been on our list of, of high-risk programs since 2003. The partnership between Met the federal government and states is a central tenet of the Medicaid program. Within broad federal requirements, states have flexibility to design and implement Medicaid based on their unique needs. The overall program is overseen at the federal level by CMS. However, despite oversight efforts by CMS, overall improper payments continue to increase from 29 billion to 37 billion between fiscal year 2015 and 2017. My statement today will focus on three broad areas critical to improving Medicaid oversight, addressing data challenges, strengthening federal oversight, and improving and expanding federal and state collaboration. First, data challenges. CMS oversight relies on state reported data that address multiple aspects of Medicaid, including expenditures and utilization of services. We and others have reported that insufficiencies in these data have affected CMS's ability to ensure proper payments and beneficiaries access to care. We've raised concerns about the usefulness of state reported data due to issues with completeness, accuracy, and timeliness. To address these long-standing concerns, TMS has worked to develop a more nas a reliable national repository, TMSIS. Implementing TMSIS has been and will continue to be a significant multi-year effort. Nearly all states are reporting some TMSIS data. While recognizing this progress, more work is needed before CMS or states can use TMSIS for program oversight. For example, it remains unclear when all states will report complete and comparable TMSIS data and how CMS and states can best use these data to improve the program. Second, strengthening program oversight. Our work has identified other areas where CMS should take action. CMS has implemented many of our related recommendations, yet additional actions are needed to further strengthen program oversight. First, our work has identified program risks associated with provider enrollment and beneficiary eligibility. Continuing to develop strategies to address these risks and monitor progress will improve CMS oversight and reduce improper payments. Second, additional oversight is needed to ensure that Medicaid beneficiaries are able to access necessary health care services. This is particularly critical for beneficiaries who rely on long-term services and supports, as well as behavioral health needs, including treatment for those with opioid use disorders. It's important to note that Medicaid is the largest payer for both long-term and behavioral health care. 
Third, collaboration between the federal government and the states. Identifying and sharing program integrity practices is critical. And there are challenges, but also some successes here. In March 2017, we reported that collaborative audits in which CMS work at, with states in partnership have great potential, but they're limited in their current use. We recommend that CMS take steps to remove barriers that limit state participation in these audits. In 2016, CMS, GAO, and a select group of state audit officials met to discuss future collaboration and specific areas of concern in Medicaid. Involving the state auditors in program oversight adds an important arsenal to reducing improper payments in Medicaid. Lastly, in 2012, CMS created the Healthcare Fraud Prevention Partnership to study and share healthcare-related information on fraud, waste, and abuse. Participants have told us that the partnership helped them identify potentially fraudulent providers and foster information sharing. Chairman Meadows and Palmer, Ranking Members Raskin and Demings, and members of the subcommittee, this concludes my prepared statement, and I'll be pleased to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Yoakum. Uh, Mr. Prepara, is that how you say it? You can go ahead and correct me. Everybody else does. That, that so. is how you say it. <laughs> OK, all right. Well, the gentleman from Louisiana is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman and members, Darrell Prepara, legislative auditor for Louisiana. I really come to speak with you specifically today about the underutilization of state auditors across our nation in the fight against fraud, waste, abuse, and improper payments. I've heard it mentioned here a few, a few times today uh, that it was $36 billion problem. I want to remind everyone that's federal dollars. There's an additional $20 billion or so of state dollars that are also uh, being misspent. State, I want to talk to you specifically about how the state auditors roll. State auditors are required by the Single Audit Act to audit the, the Medicaid program. So that's one of our, our job responsibilities. We get our instructions from the OMB through what's called a compliance supplement. That's kind of the, the audit program. What, what are we to do? I want to talk to you about some, some inadequacies in this. The Medicaid program has, as a key determination point for eligibility, is an, the income component based upon modified adjusted gross income of the recipient. However, the compliance supplement, the, the, the document that we're to operate under, specifically tells the state auditor that we're not to test Medicaid eligibility based upon modified adjusted gross income. Now, the, 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 the rationale behind that is, is because CMS is, has some other, other oversight mechanisms. Well, in the state of Louisiana, that other oversight mechanism is part of this pilot project, but that, that, that test was given to our Department of Health. So you have the department who is administering the program auditing itself when it comes to eligibility using the modified adjusted gross income. That's a scope limitation for the auditor. It's a significant departure from proper auditing procedures. State auditors also do not have access to data that we need, specifically federal tax information. Access to the federal tax information is, is restricted by 26 USCA 6103 federal law. We have access to the tax data when we're auditing our Department of Revenue. So if, I'm, if my auditors are auditing our Department of Revenue, we've got the federal tax data. But if I'm auditing over at the Department of, of, of Health and Hospitals, looking at my Medicaid program, now I can't use the very thing that I can use over here on my right hand. I can't let my left hand see it. So it's a significant, it's counterproductive restraint upon us. Furthermore, the federal regulations do not require the examination of federal tax data when making eligibility determinations. We learned that 25 states actually use federal tax data, but the remainder do not use the federal tax data. But since we're basing the program on, on modified adjusted gross income, I would think it'd be, uh, it'd be wise to use the federal tax data. The, 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 the other databases that we are using don't encompass all of the income categories. For example, it does include self-employment, farming and fishing, rental, rents, royalties, retirements, pensions, and alimony, and many other things. And so we're using, we're kind of operating the program with our hands tied behind our back. I also want to talk to you about what I believe is a costly effect of the reasonable compatibility standard. The reasonable compatibility standard came about with the Affordable Care Act, and it's a policy or rule of the, of the CMS. And what it does is it allows an individual to attest to an income when they're applying for Medicaid, but then, and then the state agency is to verify that income by using electronic data sources such as wage data. 
And so if they attest to, a, say, 138% of federal property limit, and that's my attested to income, but the state looks over at the wage data and sees that the individual makes, let's say, 160% of, uh, of uh, federal property limit, in the state of Louisiana, we use a reasonable compatibility standard of 25%. That individual is going to be deemed eligible, even though their income is higher than the 138%. And so uh, I believe that that's a, it's just a, it's a standard that it not only creates a significant problem for auditors, because we really can't see where the, where the line is anymore, but it's also we've extended the upper limit of Medicaid eligibility by doing that. Now, why are these issues important to me? Let me tell you why they're important. In 2017, our state formed the Medicaid Fraud Task Force. I chair that committee. It's a legislative committee. We did a test, and we took 860,000 individuals, uh, basically our adult population, and we asked our Department of Revenue, because I can't get the data, we asked our Department of Revenue to compare what, they were, what the individuals put on their Medicaid application, compare it to their tax returns. 83,000 individuals came back as they had a tax return income of 20000 or more different than what was on their Medicaid application. We can't make any conclusions from that, but it does point to a significant risk that there is a problem. In addition, 48% of the applicants had household sizes for their tax returns different than what their Medicaid. Now, I realize the rules are a little different, but they're very much the same. I believe that we need to be looking for new audit approaches. And the state auditor needs to be uh, right in the middle of this. Currently, dollars are flowing from the federal government to our attorney generals to, to prosecute fraud, but very few dollars are going to our state auditors all around our nation to help prevent and detect these improper payments before they happen. Thank you, gentlemen. Take any questions you have. Thank you so much. Mr. Schneider, you're uh, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and good morning, um, ranking members Connolly and, and Raskin, and members of the subcommittees. Uh, I'm Andy Schneider, a research professor of the practice at the Center for Children and Families. The center is an independent, nonpartisan policy and research organization based in the Bacourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. Uh, our mission is to expand and improve high quality, affordable health coverage for America's children and families, particularly those with low and moderate incomes. I want to emphasize I'm here in my individual capacity, and my views do not necessarily represent the views of Georgetown University. Thank you for the invitation to testify. Um, I'm especially honored to be here. I had the privilege of serving as Chief Health Counsel to the full committee in 2007 and 2008, and I know from that experience how important the oversight efforts of this committee's members and staff can be to making government work better. And thank you for holding this hearing which I think is in the best tradition of government oversight. Medicaid's an enormously important health insurer for America's low-income children and families. A growing body of research added to just this week by analysts at America's health insurance plans demonstrates that Medicaid is working well for children and adults alike, giving them access to care and preventive services at levels similar to those who have commercial coverage. All that said, Medicaid is not perfect. It can and should be improved by, among other things, reducing the rate of improper payments. And I hope today's hearing will get us to that result. I want to make three quick points. Um, first, Medicaid's 10.1 percent improper payment rate is too high and it needs to come down. There is a clear path forward to bringing it down, a path that the Office of Inspector General is also urging this morning, which is to fully implement the provider screening and enrollment requirements that are already on the books. By identifying bad actors, keeping them out of the program, provider screening and enrollment will protect children and families and other Medicaid beneficiaries from substandard care, at the same time preventing the theft or diversion of federal and state funds from their intended use. Secondly, I want to underscore a point made by Mr. Hill. Payments made to fraudulent providers are clearly improper, but improper payments are not the same as fraud. Fraud is a deception or misrepresentation made by a person or entity with the intent of receiving an unauthorized payment. Improper payments, in contrast, are payments that should not have been made or that were made in an incorrect amount. They include payments made to providers who have defrauded the program, but they also include unintentional documentation errors, noncompliance with provider screening and enrollment requirements. The way to reduce fraud, as well as improper payments generally, is to screen providers before allowing them to treat Medicaid beneficiaries and build the Medicaid program. And that's true whether you're in a fee-for-service or in a managed care mode. 
My last point is that Medicaid is a successful health insurer for four in 10 of our nation's children, in large measure because of its federal state financing partnership. And as GAO testified this morning, CMS can improve that partnership by improving its expenditure and utilization data and strengthening its oversight. Disrupting that partnership by capping federal Medicaid payments to states won't improve the oversight, it won't prevent fraud, and it won't reduce improper payments. Instead, it'll put low-income children and families at severe risk for rationing of care. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Schneider. Thank you all for your uh, insightful testimony. And as I mentioned earlier, your entire written testimony, if you did not cover it orally, will be made part of the record. I will now recognize my good friend and the gentleman from Virginia, uh, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Conley, for his opening statement. I thank uh, the chair. And uh, in the interest of uh, time, I'm going to forego my formal opening statement. I'd echo some, uh, some of what we just heard from the panelists, particularly Mr. Schneider. Um, a, Medicaid works. Um, it, it, it does its job. 76 million Americans, 43 percent of them children, benefit from Medicaid. And, uh, and uh, it looks like we're going to expand those numbers. Uh, in my home state of Virginia, we're on the brink of a bipartisan agreement to finally expand Medicaid pursuant to the Affordable Care Act, which will now bring health care to 400,000 people in Virginia. So, and by the way, bring 400 million net to the coffers of the state of Virginia, allowing us to reinvest in health care and other needed investments. So that's a good thing, uh, and we will become the, I believe, the 33rd state uh, to expand Medicaid, uh, states led by both Republicans and Democrats. But secondly, the point Mr. Schneider just made, and I know echoed by our panelists, uh, but the improper payment part of Medicaid is too high. 10% is not tolerable. Uh, and we have got to work uh, to, to get that number down. And uh, that will include uh, actually implementing uh, the regulations and screenings already on the books. But it also means law enforcement's got to get more involved. We need U.S. attorneys involved. We need attorneys general to be involved. Uh, we need to beef up Medicaid's own self-policing uh, to bring that number down. Because every dollar that's an improper payment is a dollar foregone. It's a dollar not invested in health care. It's a dollar that detracts from the important core mission of Medicaid. Uh, and, and finally, I would say, Mr. Chairman, uh, working with you and, and others uh, over the years in this committee, if, you know, there are two things this committee needs to focus on uh, or can focus on that I think would make a material difference in reducing the debt, neither of which involve new taxes, neither of which involve, you know, cutting critical investments. Uh, and one is improper payments, about $142 billion a year. Multiply that times 10, and you get $1.4 trillion. Now we're talking real money. Uh, and the other is uncollected taxes, which have now grown by starving the IRS over the years to $450 billion a year. You combine those two, we're almost at $6 trillion over 10 years. And I, I for one, would be willing to commit that every, every one of those dollars we, in fact, recover, I would I'd devote to debt reduction because they're dollars we don't have now. Uh, and uh, and uh, that would be a good down payment on the national debt over a 10-year period. And it seems to me that there's some potential bipartisan common ground. Uh, you know, we'd have to make some investments. But these are two things we can do something about. And, and there's no downside to addressing them. And so I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having a hearing on the Medicaid piece today. Uh, and I look forward to having, uh, having the opportunity to hear more from our expert panelists. And again, thank you for your leadership, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thank the uh, gentleman for his comments. And, and I'd like to stress, obviously, today we're looking at, at Medicaid. Uh, but there is a huge improper payment uh, issue with the Department of Defense as well. And so uh, at times where sometimes one program looks at uh, ideologically to be aligned more with one side than the other, I can assure you in a bipartisan manner, uh, we're willing to tackle those. And so uh, I, I think uh, the spirit in which the uh, ranking member offered that. The chair is going to recognize the chairman of uh, the subcommittee, Mr. Palmer, uh, for his, a series of questions at, at this time. So uh, he's recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Hill, Medicaid payments are made to states based on the number of people eligible in each state and the state's maintenance of effort match. Uh, in other words, CMS has a reasonable estimate of how much funding to, re uh, to request from Congress on an annual basis. Given that for the last two years, uh, Medicaid and proper payments have exceeded $36 billion, does CMS inflate its funding request to include improper payments? Is that just part of your overhead? I wouldn't say that we directly, um, that the, the measure of improper payments goes into the formula to, to, to say what we're, what we're going to ask for. It's much more of an actuarial analysis of the trends over time and, uh, and what we think we're going to need in the next year given economic and other forecasts. So I, I think it's baked there, and I think that's the point that we've been, that folks have made uh, across the board here, that the, because improper payments are in the baseline, it's inflated, and to the extent that we could reduce improper payments, we would recoup some savings. Well, you've had um, uh, a number of recommendations for correcting this. Uh, Ms. Tinker, uh, thank you for being here. Um, welcome to OGR. Uh, how many recommendations has HHS Inspector General made to uh, CMS to establish a deadline for complete and accurate uh, TMS data? We have one recommendation that's... Yeah, please turn that on. Thank you. We have one recommendation... You better get that button, all right? No. <laughs> We have one recommendation that's currently still on the books um, for CMS to set a deadline um, for the completion of the TMSA system. How about uh, GAO, Ms. Yoakum? All right, we also have a recommendation. It is um, a little more detailed in terms of establishing some steps and some, some dates along the way. We think a more uh, taking a step-by-step -step approach would be helpful rather than saying we're going to get this all done by X date. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, I think it's a process, and I think it's multifaceted. It's reading the GAO's last report that I got on it that indicates, uh, and this would be true across the federal government, uh, but I think it would be applicable to CMS, is about 20% of the um, uh, improper payments is a result of, of antiquated data systems. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things that concerns me is uh, the antiquated data systems is an issue that we can resolve. Uh, obviously, we'll have to spend some additional funding, but Mr. Propera, uh, in dealing with this uh, between the state and federal level, is that an issue that um, one of the things we're seeing is that, that state systems don't always match up with federal systems. You, you have a communication um, issue with, with that. Is that a problem? Well, Mr. Chairman, data is a problem. It's a considerable problem because we're not dealing with finding a needle in a haystack here. We're dealing with finding needles in fields of haystack. So we have to have good data from the state level on up. And it's extremely hard for my office to, to get data sometimes from the managed care operators. Uh, for example, we, we, we keep talking about the, the, improper, the improper payment rate being 10%. But that number, I would tell you, is considerably understated because it includes managed care at 0.03%, which clearly we're not looking at the, the full spectrum there. Well, Ms. Yoakum, in the last uh, GAO report that I saw, there were 18 federal programs that didn't report. Among those were uh, managed care side of, of Medicaid. So, uh, and, and I agree, I, I've been talking with uh, with. Uh, uh, Mr. Dodero about this, uh, he thinks the $141 billion is understated because of the failure of, of a program such as the managed care side of Medicaid to report. Yeah, the, the estimation of managed care is focused on a very narrow piece of information. It's focused on what did the contract say um, that you would pay on a per capita basis and was the person who you paid for eligible for Medicaid? It doesn't look at whether or not the services were provided at all or whether they were necessary or anything else. Well, that's an administrative issue because is. the report also showed that you had failure to verify eligibility, failure to do proper documentation. That was about 52% of, of the improper payments. Yes. And one other question in the last few seconds I have is on the fraud. Um, is, is fraud uh, more an issue at the federal level? People uh, improper, uh, fraudulently billing the federal government for, for Medicaid payments, or is it more at the state level? Where, where's, where's the fraud most likely to occur? And, and Ms. Tinker, if you know the answer to that, you, you can respond as well. We see fraud at both the federal and the state level. 
um, in the Medicaid program because it is a shared program between both the federal government and the state. So, so when someone files a fraudulent claim, uh, they file it at the state level, which then when the state makes the payment, it includes federal dollars, or do they, uh, is it possible that they file it directly with the federal government? Directly with the state government. Directly with the state. Thank you very much. I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Alabama. The chair recognizes uh, Ranking Member Raskins for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Let me follow up on Mr. Palmer's question. Um, Ms. Yoakum, your testimony includes a statement that um, between May of 2015 and December of 2017, 11 different recommendations were made by the GAO to CMS about improvements that could be made in terms of ferreting out fraud. But your testimony also says that these recommendations have not been adopted yet by CMS, and I'm wondering, I don't know, Mr. Hill, if you could speak to that. Why were they not adopted, and what's the, the holdup there? So I would need to go back, and unfortunately, I don't know specifically the 11 recommendations. I know as a general matter, sometimes the recommendations that are offered require change in regulation, sometimes, not often, but sometimes in statute. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the other issue in Medicaid, unlike in Medicare, because it is a shared partnership with the state, many of the recommendations that we have to implement, we have to do in partnership with our state partners. And so we've talked a lot, for example, about provider enrollment and screening. We can require states to do that and issue guidance and tell states they need to be doing a better job, but the actual on-the-ground implementation of screening, for example, takes place at the state. Uh -huh. So the shared partnership, I think, does introduce some level of uh, slowness to our response. To the okay. Well, I'd be interested in, in following yep. those recommendations because, you know, lots of times we have great hearings and then recommendations come out and we don't see anything happen, so I'd love to see the follow-through on that. So um, I, I wonder if somebody would dig down deeper into this whole question of fraud. Um, is most of the fraud provider-based fraud, or is it actually people who are um, impersonating beneficiaries or fabricating information on applications? I mean, what is the nature of the fraud component of the problem? And I don't know, Mr. Schneider, if... You've got in there, Mr. Prepare. Yeah. So I don't know that I'm the most qualified person to speak to this. Okay. Maybe, um, Mr. Prepare, I have some experts on, on okay. this who have the data, right? Okay. Let's take Mr. Prepare, Mr. Hill. Uh, thank you, sir. I think I can approach it from the state level. For at the state level, our attorney general offices they have, they have the Medicaid fraud control units, so they're looking at fraud. But the funds that flow from the federal government to to operate those units are strictly for provider fraud. My, my attorney general, if he were sitting here today, would tell you he would very much like to work in the area of recipient fraud, but right now he's prevented from doing so. Now, my office focuses not just on fraud, but we focus on fraud, waste, abuse, the whole gamut. Uh, and, and we're, you know, strategically what we want to do is make recommendations to improve the process going forward. But I can tell you this, in the past, and as I heard about other recommendations, there have been times when I have written findings on my Department of Health that says for the eighth consecutive year and then the finding. And, and that seems to me where there's part of the problem is holding the agencies accountable and somehow forcing the, 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 the changes that are needed to, to prevent the, the, the waste and abuse. Thanks, Mr. Hill. I, I would say that uh, in terms of the type of fraud that we see, and I've worked in Medicare and I've worked in Medicaid, the key to the kingdom is a, is a card, is an eligibility card. So I, we don't see a lot of fraud of an individual beneficiary saying, I'm going to lie on my taxes to get Medicaid. They'll get eligible, and then typically what we'll see is they'll then be in cahoots. There'll be some sort of scheme with a Medicaid beneficiary or a Medicare beneficiary and a group of providers mm -hmm. to generate fictitious billings or fraudulent billings, and it's much more of a... So it's collective activity. Yeah, it's more like I a mean, conspiracy. They're, they're than smarter than we are many times, and they mm -hmm. have found ways to ping and game our systems. And typically, once somebody gets eligibility, they're able to, if they're so inclined, defraud us using uh, nefarious providers to bill and get paid. Okay, yes, Ms. Yoakum. I would just add that if you can uh, screen and enroll and ensure that your providers act in good faith, you've managed most of the fraud. A, a beneficiary alone trying to commit fraud needs a complicit provider. So um, focusing the attention on ensuring good screening and enrollment processes is, is critical. 
Great. Okay, my final question is about data. Everybody seems to agree that a much more comprehensive data system is going to be essential to lower that 10 percent rate. Um, but are there legislative changes that need to be made, or can all of this be, be done through regulatory action? Mr. Holton. We, we, in terms of collecting data from states and, and us aggregating the data, we don't see it as a statutory problem. If you want to write a check and give us more money, we're always happy to, um, to, to sort of have more infrastructure. But the issue really is compliance with states and us working with states to get the data in uh, at the federal level that they already have at the state level. So it's not really a statutory issue from our perspective. Thank you. You'll back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes for a series of questions. Uh, Ms. Ms. Tinker, let me let me come to uh, to you uh, as as we look at uh, at this uh, transformed medical statistical information system, or I guess T M S I S, as they would say. Um, how significant are your concerns about the quality of the information in there? We have concerns. We have significant concerns about the quality of the data. Okay, let me give it to you in a different way, which may be on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the most highest, most concerned, what number would you give it? That's a pretty difficult question to answer. As the uh, that's why we I'm here. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. How I would answer is, while we're very pleased that states are reporting in data now and almost all are there, that that really means that we're really at the starting line and not at the finish line in terms of building TMSIS. We're still looking to see that the data has the quality necessary to perform program integrity efforts, specifically that all states report all data. And secondly, that when states are reporting that data, that it's actually uniform, that all states interpret the data right. pieces the same way. Yeah, Ms. Tinker, you've been well coached. And so I'm gonna give you another piece of advice. When I ask a question on one to 10, you might as well go ahead and answer it because I'm not going to stop until you answer it. So uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, mm -hmm. with 10 being most concerned, what number would you give it? I would give it a 7. Thank you, Ms. Tinker. Mr. Hill, you in your statement, I think you said that 98 percent of uh, those uh, that should be reporting are reporting. Is that correct? That's correct. And so uh, would you say 98 percent is a good percentage? It is. Okay. Out of the 98%, based on the statement that Ms. Tinker gave me with a 7 being a concern, um, how much of, of the 98% data can you actually use? Right. I, I mean, I, would sh I share Ms. Tinker's concern. I would, I would, I would not say we're necessarily at the, fin at the starting line. We're probably midfield. Uh, but it is absolutely the case that the first thing that we had to accomplish was get the states to report. We now have them to report. The next challenge for us uh, is being sure that, as described, the data is uniform, that we can use it, that states are reporting. So can you use it today? We're using it today. We, I, we're, can you use it accurately today? Uh, I would not want to rely a, a, a whole lot of policy analysis on the data that we have because we've so. So it means that we've got 98% com compliance of unuseful data. Right, and, I, and the, the... Do you not see a problem with that? I, I see a, a program that we have to continue. I implementing. see your staff behind you. They're nodding that there's a real problem with that. And so as we look at that, how do you, how do you fix that? Uh, I mean, because fix, for you to come and say, well, we got a 98% right. compliance rate, we really don't have a 98% compliance rate because Ms. Yoakum and Ms. Tinker both uh, in their testimony have shown the quality of the data is worthless. So if the quality of data is worthless, um, why are we focusing on a compliance rate of 98 percent? I would not characterize the data as worthless first. Uh, and as I but, said... But I, you just said you can't use it. Um, well, I think it's, it's important to understand how we build data systems, right? So this is not an information system that we're using to process and pay claims like the states are. We're asking states to aggregate their claims data and give it to us to put in a database that we can use to do analytics. The first step in that process is for them to build that interface, to give us that data, and to put it into TMSIS, and that's where we have it. But, Until but we, the uh, ranking member, hold on, let me, yeah. I'm, I'm running out of time. The ranking member and I have the Data Act. We have a number of other systems when we look at that. We have a dashboard on FATARA, which you know is the Conley ISA bill, is that correct? Uh, so uh, uh, when we look at, at that, Bad data going in makes those systems worthless. 
and uh, you say that it's not worthless, but at the same time, asking them to comply uh, is is a real problem. So let, let me let me shoot real quickly uh, to another area. It appears that one point two billion dollars worth of improper payments uh, actually come from three states. Is that correct, Ms. Tinker? $1.2 billion in, in estimated improper payments came, came from three different states? We did find beneficiary eligibility errors in three states, California, New York, and Kentucky, totaling $1.2 billion. All right. So what can we do to fix this? I mean, if it's three states, I would say that was a target-rich environment that we can focus on those three states. The main causes of the errors we found were human errors and eligibility system um, inability to actually perform the functions it needed to. The recommendations that we made to states were three. One, that where we found errors, they do the redeterminations necessary. Two, that they put policies and procedures in place to properly train people so that we could decrease the human errors. And third, that they um, update their systems so that they could better talk to other data systems um, to get the correct information to make those determinations. So, Mr. Hill, are you going after the $1.2 billion? Uh, the, we, the, we, the one point two was identified as a potential overpayment. There wasn't a recommendation to collect it because... It well, let me give you a recommendation. Collect it. I mean, it's the American taxpayers' dollars. I mean, $1.2 billion. Is your sworn testimony here today is because you didn't get a recommendation to collect no. $1.2 billion in improper payments? You're not going after it? No. The, the, the recommendations were to fix the systems in California and New York. So are you going after it or not? Uh, we are not issuing a disallowance to California, Kentucky, okay. and New York. Okay. I, I want you to report back to this committee in 30 days on why you decided to ignore $1.2 billion in improper payments and decided not to collect it. Yep. All right. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, the, the ranking member, Mr. Connolly, for a generous six minutes. I thank the chair. Um, and let me echo what the chairman just said, Mr. Hill. I mean, we, on a bipartisan basis, we simply cannot say that, well, we've lost that. Um, if for no other reason besides the fact that this is taxpayer money, but also if we're going to get serious about improper payments, we've got to get serious about improper payments. How about we start now? And people have to know they can't get away with it that mistakes will be corrected and fraud or abuse will be pursued um, and, and vigorously. And we're prepared to back you up on a bipartisan basis, but we need you to do it. So uh, I strongly uh, support the chairman's uh, recommendation that uh, we, uh, we review, if not rescind, the decision not to pursue that $1.2 billion. Um, let me ask a question uh, about how much we know about the data, and, I, and let me find, Ms. Yoakum, Ms. Tinker, Mr. Hill, um, how much of Medicaid f uh, improper payments is, is fraud? How much of it is fraud? Because in Medicare, for example, Mr. Hill, we know it's about $50 billion a year in fraud in Medicare. Uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, most of it is provider fraud. As you pointed out, it's not individual beneficiaries committing fraud, though some may be involved, but it's actually, and this is always hard for the public to believe, that doctors cheat. They lie. They steal. Not all doctors, of course, but a handful of bad actors, but it adds up to a lot of money, a lot of money. So in Medicaid, how much of, it, of the total improper payment we're looking at is fraud? Because one has to disaggregate the kinds of improper payments because there are different strategies. You know, if it's overpayment because we messed it up on, on, you know, we thought you were eligible and you weren't, we thought you qualified for this additional benefit but you didn't or you did, um, that can be addressed through management, personnel, and technology. Fraud is different. That, that has a law enforcement element to it, which I'm going to get to. But but in order to know how we marshal our resources to get at the improper payments, we got to be able to accurately say this much is fraud. So what percentage of total Medicaid improper payments is fraud? My understanding in the, the way we measure improper payments now, you can't disaggregate. It doesn't measure fraud for a variety of reasons. As you just described, it, it measures compliance errors. It measures where documentation is missing. Sometimes when you're looking at a fraudulent claim, it's going to look perfect. 
right? It wouldn't show up as an error because the fraudulent provider is going to make sure that they get it through the system uh, in a way that it will get paid. And so it's a much more complicated analysis to make the determination on whether it's fraud involving law enforcement partners and others. So it's my understanding we don't have a measure, you know, a rigorous measure as we do with the payment error rate measurement program for fraud in Medicaid, um, which is why we spend time with our law enforcement partners and in partnership with our states uh, to identify it in an investigatory way, uh, but it's not something that we can use the PERM program to, to, to address. It's distressing to hear you say that because I don't know how you have a coherent, let alone effective, uh, uh, countermeasure to improper payments. To, I mean, ideally, we want to bring improper payments to zero. Right. Now, we know that we're never going to quite reach zero, but we certainly can do better than $142 billion a year. But I, I, can't, I can't devise a strategy that's efficacious if I can't disaggregate fraud from administrative errors or technical error in the computer. Ms. Yoakum, help us. Can GAO help uh, Mr. Hill disaggregate that global number so that we're dealing with uh, uh, its component parts and developing efficacious strategies. Yeah. Um, I don't have good news in terms of a percentage. Oh, Ms. Yoko, come on. I'm if there was sorry. one person in this room <laughs> I thought would bring me good news, it was you. However, we do have a fraud risk framework that we have put together and have um, looked at CMS's practices to prevent fraud. And we have found that those are lacking. There are things that CMS could be doing to uh, better look strategically across its programs and to coordinate within its programs in order to better prevent fraud. Well, le let me make an informal request of GAO, and, and I, I'm sure my, my colleagues, uh, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Palmer, Mr. Raskin, as uh, respective chairman and ranking member, uh, would join in the request. We, we need you to get back to us in developing methodologies for disaggregating the improper payment global number so that we can better devise strategies. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I concur with the ranking member, and so I would ask uh, within uh, 60 days if you can come back to this committee with, with a plan to do that, Ms. Yoakum, if, once you check with uh, your uh, colleagues. Uh, because I don't know how we do it rationally, frankly, if we can't have that kind of analytical tool. Um, and my final question, because I don't want to impose uh, on my good friend and brilliant thespian uh, <laughs> who makes Shakespeare happy every time she appears on the stage, Eleanor Holmes Norton. But, uh, but before that, uh, how well are we using, I, I mean, Mr. Prepare is here from Louisiana and doing his job at the state level. but. An observation, I don't think we're using U.S. attorneys all that well for fraud. Um, and I'll give you an example. I, I know of one example uh, personally, but a few years ago, the U.S. attorney in Boston decided to make Medicare fraud a very high priority. And guess what happened? Her office alone recovered, identified and mostly recovered $3 billion. One office because she made it a priority. There are 99 U.S. attorneys. And my sense is it's kind of up to the individual U.S. attorney whether this is a priority or, you know, we'll, we'll look for it if we see it and find it, maybe we'll do something about it, as opposed to saying, no, one of our top five this year or top three or whatever it might be is going to be fraud, Medicare fraud, Medicaid fraud. Um, any of you want to comment on that? I mean, because I think, I think that's an underutilized tool as well uh, that uh, could really make a difference in reducing improper payments. Ms. Tinker. We believe that obviously working closely with our partners in the U.S. Attorney's Office is extremely important. Um, and in fact, when you look at the return on investment in 2017, there were $4.7 billion in expected recoveries, um, over 881 criminal actions and 826 civil actions. But an additional important part in Medicaid is our work with the Medicaid Fraud Control Units. In 2017, in our Medicaid Fraud Control Unit annual report, we found that $1.8 billion had been recovered as a result of the efforts of Medicaid Fraud Control Units across the country, including 1,500 convictions, 1,100 exclusions, meaning providers who are no longer able to participate in federal healthcare programs, 
and over 961 civil settlements and judgments. We're very proactive in working to prevent um, fraud and to so, bring bad so actors. My time is up. So, but what you're saying to us is you're, you're happy with the cooperation you're getting from U.S. attorneys. There's always more we can be doing, without a doubt. Oh. So, Ms. Tinker, I, I want to follow up on that. If you will help us identify perhaps those uh, U.S. attorney districts where you get more help, uh, it, it would help us, uh, uh, you know, to the, to the ranking members' uh, concern. No, that's so right. If you, if you could help us do that. I mean, that's not a formal request, but if you will get that as part of the uh, uh, report back. And I see your staff nodding behind, so I feel we're, we're in good shape. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Hill, how many, how many Americans uh, are in the Medicaid program? Uh, I think we have 70 million people, roughly. In the 70 million? Yep. And what has happened to that number since Obamacare and the Medicaid expansion? Uh, under the Medicaid expansion, we added about roughly 11 million people to Medicaid. So it increased you know, fairly significantly. Mm -hmm. All right, so of the 70 million, um, how many of those 70 million are able-bodied adults? Well, in, in general, the expansion was expanded to uh, adults, childless adults, uh, and so I would, I would venture to guess that the majority of the folks in the Medicaid expansion are folks who otherwise wouldn't have been covered either as a... So it's safe to say the 11 million is probably all in that category. Right. And some of the previous 59 million were probably in that category as well, even though Medicaid initially started off for disabled and kids and different things, you know, right. that kind of po those kind of populations. It's fair to say that there was some portion of the 59 million prior to Obamacare who were able-bodied adults as well. To the extent states had expanded to that group, yes. The number we've heard is 28 million able-bodied folks in the Medicaid population. You think that's accurate? I have, I'm not familiar with that number. Okay. All right. But it's some, something more than 11 million? Presumably, yes. All right. Of that 11 million, do you know how many are working? How many have a job? I think, I mean, the, the data suggests that um, a large proportion of the folks who are in Medicaid who can work, in other words, who are not disabled or a, a, a caretaking parent, um, are working. I don't have the specific number. Kaiser Foundation says 40% of that able-bodied adult population in the Medicaid program aren't working. Think that's accurate? I'd need to go back and look at the Kaiser that's data. That's a big number, that's though, a, right? Are not working, correct. That's a darn big number. Now, the, the, the Democrats have sent a letter a couple months ago that said we should not even think about work requirements for able-bodied adults getting taxpayer money in the Medicaid, largely the Medicaid expansion program. You agree with that? Well, as you know, the administration is pursuing a number of waivers under our authority to uh, promote community engagement. We've got a number of states that we've already approved. I'm asking you, do you agree with that? You think we, you think well, we have a need of work, re work requirement? Well, work it's, program? it's the administration's policy that we're pursuing a work requirement and community engagement for states who believe that that works for their Medicaid system. Yeah. How about, how about you, Ms. Yoakum? You think we need to do that? Well, I think we need to carry well, out the... I'm going to ask some, ask some other people. Well, as, as others have said, right, we're here representing the administration, and I'm representing the administration's position. Um, how many waivers have you given thus far to states to, uh, to uh, implement a work, work requirement for the Medicaid expansion population, or for, uh, for anyone in Medicaid? Three. Uh, Kentucky, Indiana, and Arkansas are the first three states that we've approved waivers for. Anyone else ask? Uh, there's a number of states in the pipeline. How many? Um, I think a total of 10 or 11 states have expressed interest, and uh, they're all in various stages of review right now. How long does it take to get the approval? Uh, not well, you know, uh, overcoming and sort of getting our policy squared away. Once we got the first waiver approved, uh, they can go through relatively quickly, anywhere from, you know, three months, six months, nine months. Sometimes the waivers are packaged up with other uh, innovations that the state wants to pursue that, that are not necessarily Wait, it takes community. nine months for you guys to okay the state who says we want to make people who are able-bodied folks, and they, we, the state says we want to acquire a work component, maybe a work study component, maybe a training component, and you take nine months for you to give them the thumbs up to do that? Well, we try and do it as quickly as we can, depending upon what the state is asking for and how complex their waiver is. Of that 40% of, of this at least 11 million number, I think it's closer to 28 million who are able-bodied and non-working. How many of them are younger folks? How many are under 35, under 40? Well, I think the, the, that able-bodied or that expansion population is 19 to 65, uh, anywhere from 19 up to 65. I don't know the distribution of how many are in what age category. Again, I think most of it from what we've 
seen in other studies, most of them are younger folks. So you got younger folks, able-bodied, in the program, states coming to you saying, we would like to impose a work requirement, and you're telling me it takes nine months to give them the thumbs up. I'm telling you we work as fast as we can, get the waivers approved, depending upon how complex they are coming and, in and from the what's state. It, again, refresh memory, how many states have asked for the waivers thus far? Uh, we've approved three, and I think there's 11 in the pipeline. 11 have asked? You know which, which uh, how long ago some of these states ask? Um, most of them have all been since uh, last January. Some were, were in, previous, uh, in the previous administration. Well, this is, this, is, this is important. I mean, you talk to taxpayers across the 4th District of Ohio, my guess is taxpayers, even in the Democrat districts who sent this, this letter saying don't do this, uh, a bunch of taxpayers would say this makes so much sense, particularly when so much of the population is, is who are in Medicaid, who are able-bodied, are younger folks. The fact that there's not a work component it just boggles people's minds. So I would just encourage you to work a little faster and get those waivers approved and make sure this happens. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, before I recognize the gentlewoman from uh, the District of Columbia, I want to make sure we clarify your, your testimony because I think you said it one way and the gentleman from Ohio came back. There's been 14 states who have requested the waiver. You have granted three, 11 are in the hopper. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. The 11, I'd need to go back and just be sure it's precisely 11, but roughly 11. Okay. Could it, Mr. Chairman, could I just piggyback on your clarification? One of those pending states is Tennessee. Is that correct? I believe so, yes. And Tennessee has estimated that this work waiver requirement um, would actually cost $18.5 million to implement, and they've asked permission to use TANF money, take, taking sort of from Peter to pay Paul, uh, to do that. Is that correct? Uh, I know that there, I've seen reports on how Tennessee wants to finance their work requirements, I'm right. really not in a position to get into what they've requested. And while philosophically we may agree or disagree on this, is there any reason to believe that a work requirement has anything to do with waste, fraud, and abuse and reducing improper payments? Is there um, a connection? I'm not sure that I've drawn the connection myself. I mean, work, we believe the community engagement and getting folks into work uh, thank is you. going to promote health. But um, thank you. Mr. Sorry, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Yes. Work requirement has everything to do with treating taxpayers with respect, able-bodied adults, many of these folks, younger folks, many of them single men, and you don't have to do anything to get free health care from the taxpayer. So it has everything to do with treating the people who pay for this with the respect they deserve. That's why it's so critical. And, oh, by the way, it might actually help the recipient. That's why we're for it. All right. The, 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 the chair recognizes uh, his uh, allowance of a colloquy that, that came up uh, without the intention of that, so the chair is going to recognize the, no, intention. <laughs> no intention of colloquy from this, the gentleman from Virginia. The chair <laughs> recognizes the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia uh, for a generous five minutes. I, I thank my good friend, the chairman. He's always fair to me. That was just a debate in case you wondered what was just happening there. Uh, I want to thank my good friend uh, from Virginia, the ranking member, for mentioning our work together, making fun of members of Congress with Shakespeare uh, every year. It's one of the highlights. Does a gentlewoman want to take down, strike down his words? <laughs> <laughs> no, On the contrary. <laughs> he and I uh, are, are part of this play acting, Democrats and Republicans. Uh, and I must say, it gets us, it makes us understand that not all play acting occurs from this podium. Uh, just let me uh, say something about a waiver in order to allow people to work right here. I would welcome a waiver for people who are not working in the District of Columbia on Medicaid, and with that waiver, I would need, in this knowledge economy, uh, from the agencies who who grant the waiver, help in finding jobs for people in the District of Columbia uh, who are on Medicaid who are not working. I haven't found them as I go around my district. I don't know if this happens uh, in yours, but if you want a job here uh, and you don't have a high school education, uh, then you need training, you need what the federal government is not offering such people. Most of the people on Medicaid are elderly, uh, disabled, or children. So let's understand who we're talking about. What I don't understand is the definition of terms. 
uh, once we get a term, it just begins to be used as if everybody understood what it means. Improper payment rate has been used over and over again. I thank you, Mr. Hill, for clarifying that that does not mean deliberate fraud. And one of the things I'd ask the chairman to do is to call for a uh, task force of U.S. attorneys to work with the agency. I don't think you are equipped to tell us what is fraud and what is not as fraud. A stay that is a member of the District of Columbia Bar that you need help, particularly since you're not even able to disaggregate. That's very, very uh, unfortunate because we're using improper payments to cover all payments. And, and that's not very professional here, and it won't help you to uncover those improper uh, payments. Um, so let's find out what we mean. Uh, in HHS's 2017 financial report, and here I'm quoting, improper payments are not necessarily expenses that should not have occurred. So why don't we just start there? Uh, can you explain how payments are categorized as improper and how improper payments could be legitimate payments? Any of you, please, help us clarify what we're talking about here. Uh, I'll start, and we can let others jump in, and we can turn back to our three-state audit in California, Kentucky, and New York, where we're looking at eligibility systems failures, and it can be the case that a state has not complied with all the rules that we've established for verifications, for checking income, for uh, determining whether or not a person was eligible. Uh, if they have not completed those um, system checks, we would count that eligibility uh, decision as an error, and that would be a payment error. Um, so that's an error, not fraud. Right, and, but in Improper fact... Improper because it's an error. Right, but it does not mean necessarily that all those payments should not have been made. So, for example, when a state in those instances would have gone back and done the redetermination, actually fulfilled the checks that they were supposed to have fulfilled, and found that the person was in fact eligible, the payment would have been made. So it is an improper payment because the, the state has not complied. Um, but it is, it may not necessarily... And of course, that the state may at a later date correct right. the, uh, right. the, Similarly the mistake. Similarly with, with providers who... And we're talking about uh, some people who don't have high school education, some people who are elderly, some people who may have given the wrong data, some people who may not have had the, the right data. Mr. Chairman, can I... Uh, the, 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 uh, that was really basic, my, my basic point to try to clarify what we're talking about here, to understand that the agency itself uh, has not, in fact, been able to decide whether we're talking about fraud or not. Every member of this body has women, children, elderly. The majority of, of the people we're talking about may have committed errors, but it would be uh, terrible to cat categorize them together with, as Mr. Hill says, there are very few people who set out to lie on their, their forms, whether they're income tax or other forms, and therefore commit fraud. And so, Mr. Chairman, I'd call upon uh, the committee again, if you would, at least as a pilot, to ask some U.S. attorneys to join with some members of the agency so that they can begin to, in fact, go after fraud. And I would be glad to have my, my district be one of those who would work with the agency on actual fraud, so then you could come back and give us a report on progress you are making. I am outraged if there is actual fraud at a time when we are seeing cuts of all kinds in services and in Medicaid and, and, and all kinds of, of threats to cover exactly the kind of, of uh, of services and benefits to women, children, the elderly and disabled, as are involved in, in Medicaid. So a task force would help us clarify what we mean. I don't think we can ask the agency, which is not a law enforcement agency, to do this on its own. Well, I, I think the, the gentlewoman's perspective on that, as she might have recalled in my opening statement, we do know that fraud is part of the problem because of what granted, happened, granted. What, what happened in Virginia 
and what happened in North Carolina that I highlighted in my opening statement. And so in doing that, I think it's incumbent upon us before we get the U.S. attorneys involved. Ms. Tinker, I've already asked you to help us identify those. But it's incumbent on Mr. Hill. To, it's about quality data. And, and the truth is, it's not as much the beneficiaries, uh, as Ms. Yoakum has pointed out, as those that are actually providing that. That's where the fraud comes from. So it's not actually as much your individual constituents as maybe a constituent who's providing the service where the greatest amount of fraud happens. And so I think if you can help us, Mr. Hill, highlight that. Uh, I think uh, the, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grothman, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I'm not sure how many cuts there are, but I worry about cuts to the men, too. A um, couple questions here. First of all, uh, for Mr. Perpera, um, as far as Louisiana is concerned, we talk about over time going for fee-for-service fee to managed care. I'd like you to comment the degree to which that will, in addition to other benefits, reduce fraud. Well, one thing to understand, uh, sir, is that under managed care, our liability is 100% from day one. So under fee-for-service, we enroll someone or, or the, and, and they become a recipient, but there, there's no payments made until they actually go and see a physician or get a prescription. Correct. But under managed care, the liability becomes first day, it's 100%. As, as to fraud, I, I can only speak for Louisiana at the moment and maybe 25 other states that don't use income tax data to, to verify the eligibility role. But realize when, when you apply for Medicaid, it's very much based upon income. And, it, and, and the only thing that most of the states have to check is the wage data. Wage data is very limited. It doesn't include all kinds of self-employment types of income. And so, for, you know, I guess we, we've talked several times today about fraud as only on the kind of on the provider side. I'm not so sure about that. But I don't know that we know either because we're not really looking. Right. Well, I guess the question is, there's a feeling with regard to medical costs in general that maybe less procedures would be done on uh, managed care than fee-for-service. And, and given that some of the fraud is from the provider side, there would be less opportunity for fraud there. I guess that's what I'm trying to get you to say, or do you think that's true or not? Well, I do, I do believe, like and for, I think it was the state of uh, Washington, their auditor <coughs> issued a report saying that for, for every dollar in improper payment that went into the system on, on managed care, it came back in the form of a dollar and a quarter and increased per member per month later on. Uh, so that, that kind of data is out there. In other words, a bad payment today can result in increased payments later in the in So you don't think that managed care would be a, would be necessarily a benefit? Is what you're telling me? Would be a, sir? Would necessarily be a benefit? You do not buy into the idea that managed care would. No, would, no, sir. I'm not saying it would not be. I, I think that uh, the data on that's still out. Uh, we are in my, in my state. We are looking or continuously looking at uh, what is the um, you know what are, what are the what are the actual cost the encounter cost uh -huh. of our managed care partners. As, as compared to the PMPMs that we're paying, uh, uh, you know, the money that we're sending them. And we're looking at that gap and trying to determine what's the extent of that gap. The, the major portion of that, I'm not, I'm not saying this is fraud, but it, it's based upon the actuarial assumptions that go into de developing the per member per month. With, in, in Louisiana, for example, the, the normal rate for a Medicaid recipient for a PMPM is, let's say, $350. It's around there. But under expansion, it's 500 Okay. Now, I don't think we've really come to understanding why it jumped so much. Okay. Another question, kind of follow-up on what a couple of people said in the past. Obviously, Medicaid is a huge benefit. And unless you don't get out at all, I think you know that people are intentionally holding down their income because they want to keep their Medicaid, which is understandable. It's such a generous program. Uh, either they're making less or maybe just reporting less income, which is maybe what you're referring to because you, you want to hold uh, under a given amount. Does anybody have any comments on that? Are there any people even beginning to make an estimate on the amount of income that the economy is losing as people either work less or find a way to work for cash to keep this generous benefit? 
Anybody giving any of that thought? Mr. Perpera, that's why we like you. You're always thinking. Yes, sir. Let me, let me just say this. I, th I think, I don't know that, I don't have any statistics on. Or do, I, do we I mean, it's people? obvious that it's going on to a degree because you hear about it if you talk to people. If we just strictly want to talk about from the fraud perspective, and I'm not trying to give any degree of, 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 yeah. of, of how many people are committing fraud in this perspective, but they don't have, in, at least in Louisiana and 25 other states, they don't have to reduce their income because we're not looking. It, it, the program's not looking right. We're looking at their wages. So if they're self-employed, they're a home-building contractor, they can, they, can, they can make as much money as they want to. We, we don't know the answer to that, and our state departments are not going to, going to know the answer to that. In addition to that, the way the regulations are written right now, I've got one of the applications in, in my briefcase back here. It says, what did you make this month? You know, what was your income this month? Well, so if you have cyclical incomes, it, it really gets crazy as to whether or not they're eligible or not eligible. Yeah, just give one, and I wasn't aware of that. You can tell me this. If I'm somebody who's working 60 hours a week from March 1st to November 30th, and I go in and apply for Medicaid on January 1st, how long do I get Medicaid for? It, in my state, they would ask you, what was your income in the previous month? Correct. And then you're going to be based upon that. And then, in addition to that, you're going to be enrolled in the system primarily for a year. Now, you have a responsibility to, to report any time that you increase your income. But we're talking about fraud, right? So if we're talking about fraud, then that individual's not going to report. Okay, in, 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 in the case I said, and, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for indulging me. In my example, if I am a guy, say, involved in construction, and I'm making 80 grand a year every year from March 1st to November 30th, and I apply on January 1st, I'm found eligible. As a practical matter, if I just let that Medicaid run and never report, some, report anything till the end of the year, am I ever going to get caught or is anything bad ever going to happen to me? Unless you're honest about what you make, I don't believe you will because in 25 states, they're not using tax data. In addition to that, let me just point out, because we're basing it on modified adjusted gross income, which is a number that looks a whole bunch like tax data, then, then you're, in your construction company, if you buy a new piece of equipment that year and decide to pull a 1079 deduction and write off more that year in your depreciation, then you may be living off 100000 but you qualify for Medicaid. Thank you. Do you think we should require all states to use tax data? I absolutely. You can answer the question. The, the, the gentleman from Wisconsin has exceeded my gracious uh, time Well, that's frame. why. So we you thought can, it was such a good question. You couldn't yeah. help but. Very, very quickly answer the question. We'll, we'll close out. I, I absolutely, sir. Sir, absolutely do. All right. I thank the gentleman from Wisconsin. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia for his closing remark. I thank the chair. And I, I, again, I think this. This hearing is a good piece of work in trying to get uh, at uh, both methodology for accounting for improper payments, disaggregating them so that we can devise strategies working together uh, to effectively reduce it. Um, I do think it's important listening sometimes to some of the rhetoric. Uh, you know, overwhelmingly, people who take advantage of Medicaid need it. They're not gaming the system. They're not takers. They're not con men. They're families who are trying to make sure they have access to health care. And what we also know is that when people have that access, uh, society benefits. Uh, there aren't free riders. Uh, people get healthier, can live more productive lives, can become taxpaying, contributing members of society. So health care is an investment. We don't want anyone cheating. We don't want people stealing. We don't want people defrauding. But let's not overstate. Uh, the, the extent of the problem. Medicaid is there for a very good reason, and it has worked. Would the gentleman yield for a moment? Of course. I, I just wanted to inject another bipartisan note here, because my colleague who just uh, spoke, who just asked questions, uh, indicated, and I'm glad the chairman allowed him to ask the question, that whether or not using tax forms would be better than having people report, for example, on a monthly basis what their income is, or even self-report. I must say, I don't, in, in terms of whether hearings are designed to, <laughs> to, to get to remedies, unless I hear something, and we need another time for this, perhaps another hearing, uh, or perhaps they could even, even respond to, to uh, the chairman's request for information 
on why tax forms wouldn't be a better way mm -hmm. uh, to get at the notion of the actual income of people so that we could get at Medicaid fraud. Well, and I yield back to my good friend. I, I thank my friend for that intervention, and I think she makes a very good point. Um, we've heard testimony here. No one has said there's massive individual fraud going on because people are gaming the system in terms of their income, reported income. There may be examples of that, and we want to try our best to perfect the system. But I want to go after institutional problems first, because that's where the real money is. And every dollar we save at that level can be reinvested in the program for people in need. Um, and so uh, you know, until and unless we have testimony that would corroborate the need for such a thing because of uh, wrongdoing by large numbers of individuals, let's focus at the problem at hand that uh, we've heard testimony from, including from the administration. Uh, and I, again, I want to thank my friend, uh, Mr. Meadows, uh, for this thoughtful hearing. And I know we're going to have others on improper payments. Uh, this committee is committed to addressing this issue and uh, working with the executive branch to do so and with our friends at GAO to develop methodologies to better capture the nature of the problem. And I thank the chair. I thank the gentleman for his uh, remarks. Uh, a few housekeeping items and, and follow-ups that I'd, I'd like to add. Uh, Mr. Schneider, uh, you, you have uh, been over there to my right. Normally, I focus on my right. Today, I didn't. Uh, uh, and in, in doing that, if you could uh, actually give us a list of the, the top three recommendations that you, either personally or in your official capacity, could make uh, to us on possibly implementing uh, uh, areas to address this uh, improper payment uh, issue. If you could do that from an intellectual standpoint, uh, are you willing to do that and get that to the committee? Uh, I am, Mr. Chairman. I, I did provide some recommendations in my, in my written statement. Do you want additional ones? Uh, three additional ones uh, above your, uh, your opening uh, written statement if you if you can and and I guess what I'm saying is based on the testimony you've heard today okay. uh, critiquing it from an intellectual standpoint if you can do that that would be very helpful uh, so I can be very specific with that request. be happy to mr. chairman all right all right thank you uh, mr. Hill let me come back to you on one area and it, it gets back to the quality of the data that we talked about with uh, uh, the, the the reporting system and the data that obviously is according to miss Yoko and Ms. Tinker is, is less than what we would want it to be, and I think from your testimony, less than what you would want it to be. We've had a number of deadlines that seem to get extended in terms of compliance. Uh, so what I, I need from you is, is really a plan, and, uh, and I'll give you uh, is 45 days enough to come up with a plan on how we can date specific uh, look at how you're going to implement and improve that quality uh, exponentially, I might add, uh, from where it is today. Is 45 days enough to get back to this yep. with date-specific targets on when you're going to do that so it addresses yep. that? Fair question. We can get uh, back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hill. And so for all of you, uh, thank you. And, and thank you for the, the thoughtful way that you've answered these questions. Uh, hopefully this has not been as painful as some o oversight hearings uh, that uh, you either may have been a part of. I know uh, from a CMS standpoint, hopefully this is better. I look back in the back and she's smiling, but uh, there have been some that have been a little bit more contentious in the past. Uh, and, uh, and, and thank you all. And if there is... Uh, no further business uh, before the, the committees uh, uh, the committees uh, stand adjourned.